This is the first video for Art 364, Art History 2. Uh, it begins at 1300 and, uh, in, in Italy. And this is uh, a little bit of a review of what the world was like just before 1300. Uh, this altarpiece that we're looking at is uh, uh, Madonna and Child enthroned with some extra oh. stories along the sides. And this would be a typical kind of uh, work of art has these characteristics uh, of, uh, of the Middle Ages. The uh, uh, the figures are very abstract. It's there's an emphasis on patterns, uh, decoration, uh, the emphasis on gold, and it making a, a precious object. The the figures are rendered kind of uh, doll like, like almost like paper doll cutouts, rather than trying to look like real people, even though they successfully tell stories when they when they need to tell stories such as here in places like a cave or other other situations sceneries uh, but they're they, they look almost like you know children's drawings kind of compared to what you think of as as natural naturalism that uh, occurs in in much later art uh, the part in the middle where the Madonna and child exist are, are, are even more removed from reality they look almost like the kind of figures in Playing cards. They're like uh, uh, they're they're very flat, patterned, and far removed from the way real people look in real life. And there was a reason for this. It's in the Middle Ages, it was very common for for works of art to um, to look like this because the the their view of of uh, Christianity and the the people in the Christian stories is one of uh, uh, as they're, they're abstracted, you know, that they're, it's, it's not of this world, it's like a, it's a spiritual thing. And the purpose of the work of art is not to show you what something looks like, but to inspire in you a, uh, a, a, a devotional mood, I guess you could say. And that, and that uh, the fact that it is removed from reality in, in, in large part is, is, is a feature, you know, not a defect of the, of the, of the, of the kind of art that they're making. You know, they want it to not look real because they, they do want to communicate stories and they do want to communicate ideas. But ideas are, you know, are meant to, to, to not be mistaken for the real things in the real world. But, you know, changes occurred before 1300 uh, that will affect the way art is, is rendered. Uh, I can show you another example. This is you know, another, another typical sort of thing, the abstract quality of faces and, and bodies and the way cloth works, you know, falling down and, you know, you can see that you know, there are places that look like, you know, someone looked at real cloth at some point in, in the past, but whoever made this probably wasn't looking at cloth, but looking at other works of art and uh, maintaining that, that uh, uh, abstract quality. Uh, looking at these figures, they look, when I say paper doll cutouts, you, you don't even feel like they, they exist in space at all. They're, they're just sort of floating there. Uh, even when they do show people kind of like they're in space, like this was one be one that's, uh, you know, from the Middle Ages, um, that's, um, you know, less removed, less like a playing card, but even so, you, know, you can see a little bit of uh, like the knee poking through the cloth there, like it's like there's actually a body under there. But mostly the figures are doll-like, and mostly the emphasis is on patterns. Uh, there's not a true sense of like figures having weight or any kind of volume. Uh, and you know maybe maybe these these figures here in the back look like you know someone observed nature a little bit and, and to show what something looked like. But overall, it's it has a very strong abstract quality. The first work in your list is by Chimabue. It falls in this tradition to, to a large extent. I mean, it's a great big picture uh, that is uh, intended to go on an altarpiece. I'm sorry, it is an altarpiece that goes on top of an altar or behind an altar. And it's you know about 12 feet tall, made of wood, uh, has a frame, it's covered with gold. Uh, it's painted with tempera paint very beautiful decorative object. Uh, when you think of, of the style though, it has a, a few characteristics that are 
that are indicating a change that's going to occur in the future. Otherwise, most of its, its aspects are, are things that you would have seen in the Middle Ages, just as we just saw the, the figure of, of Mary. You know, it looks like a, you know, a paper doll cutout. It, the figures of the, of the angels also look, look, look flat and abstract and very far removed. But in a sense, if you look at some of the details, like the, the knee here, uh, of this angel, or just the, the, the modeling, the indication of, of volume of, of the figures, the hands, the, the cloth, it seems to have a little more volume. And just the arrangement of, of figures, one in front of the other in space, rather than, you know, something like this, where the, things are just sort of floating around uh, in, 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 an, in an ambiguous space. You know, real people in real space is a different kind of thing than the normal medieval, uh, uh, the more normal uh, me means of depiction. Another thing is the, this uh, throne. It looks very massive. It looks like a big three-dimensional object with very convincing rendering of, or drawing of, of shapes to indicate that you know one shape is in above and behind and to the left and to the right of other, other shapes. So they, it does look kind of spatial. You know, even that uh, reentrant semicircle right there um, looks like the, the, it's supposed to go back into space. And uh, it surrounds the figure of Mary in a kind of way that it makes it look like she's in a space, even though she looks like a kind of a cutout. Uh, does seem to have stuff, you know, some, some bits on the left of her and bits on the right of, right of her indicating that, that uh, you know, it's a baby step in the direction of seeing a figure in space. Why, why would they even do this? Why, what, what, what kind of change would have occurred uh, to cause this? And, and, you know, part of the reason has to do with uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi in the previous century. Uh, you know, he was a, he was a man who, who uh, you know, started out as a, you know, as a, as a, as a rich kid in, in Assisi and he uh, was just like you know any other sort of spoiled kid uh, uh, had a conversion where he, he realized you know the error of his ways and, and decided to sell all of his worldly possessions and become a, uh, a monk and he started an order of monks called the, the Franciscan order and one of his characteristics was you know a, a sort of a return to a, a more uh, personal relationship with God like a direct relationship with God as opposed to the kind of relationships that had developed over the course of centuries where lots and lots of intermediaries occurred between you and God, such as uh, your local friar, your local uh, priest, the uh, uh, cardinals and bishops and hierarchy of, 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 of church people, you know, going all the way up to the Pope. And then beyond that, you have you know, the saints and Mary, uh, all interceding between you and God. And, and that's the sort of thing that when you think of all those people above you in a, in a sort of an abstract way, uh, it's appropriate to render, to render them, represent them as, as uh, removed from reality, not, not actual real people. But in, if you're going to have a personal relationship, then you know, all those stories from the Bible and all the representations of, of biblical figures as real people in real space is a, a, a more desirable thing. Now, it's not something that, that just you know, turned on a dime or anything. Uh, this first instance we have is just the tiniest uh, indication that something new is going to happen. Another altarpiece by the student of Cimabue is Giotto. Uh, it is called, it's, it's also a Madonna and child enthroned with saints and has many of the same characteristics uh, as the previous one. This is Cimabue on this side, Giotto on this side. You can see a side-by-side -side comparison where um, most of the elements are the same. Uh, Mary here with Christ in her lap, um, the architectural sort of throne, the, the saints. Uh, Cimabue has saints down here, uh, Giotto has saints back here, and a bunch of angels, all with halos that are circular, you know, drawn with a compass and uh, you know, one overlapping the other. 
Notice how, just if you just look at halos, these make a nice pattern going like this. Notice how they, they're very little overlapping uh, here, but here there's, there's like overlapping in such a way to indicate, well, these people are actually standing on the ground and they're all standing on the same ground and they, and they are you know, one in front of the other in the kind of accidental um, overlapping that would occur if you have a crowd of people, whereas here they're arranged flatly in a pattern. So the change in just in that aspect from here to here is as if the saints and the, and the angels are real people in space gathered around the throne. And the throne is uh, even more convincingly rendered as a three-dimensional object surrounding the figure compared to Chimabue's effort here. This uh, arrangement down here of saints going across the space flatly but at the same time kind of looking up as if they're looking at the figure, you know, that's, you know, uh, I guess an unsuccessful attempt at, at rendering these as if they're in the space so that they could look here. But, but here, having these people in front of, definitely in front of in space, you can see they overlap stuff. And they're looking back towards Mary in a kind of a convincing way. This step from 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 Chimaboy to Giotto is one is, is is a kind of a giant leap, in the sense that here we're conceiving of all the characters in the in this in this image as being real people in real space. Now, when we get to uh, uh, much later Renaissance artists, we're going to have uh, an even even more convincing figures in space. Uh, it's just, but it is one of degree, but it's, but it's of the same direction. What we're going to see in the Renaissance is a kind of a, a ramping up, and this is the beginning of a, of a trend. And uh, over the course of the 1400s, not the 1300s and 1400s, finally getting to, to the early part of the 1500s, we will have a uh, sort of a scaling up, a, an attempt from generation to generation of artists to to make things look more and more like the real world. Artists observing nature, um, copying what they see, thinking in terms of what's the, uh, you know, what's the best way to render this, and you know, almost com competing with one another to see who could innovate some, some aspect of, of depicting. And, uh, and, and to do the same sort of thing that Giotto, the student, did with his teacher. And, and move sort of move the ball forward in that one direction. Now, uh, another aspect that's going to change is, is the gold. See, right now you see both of these have gold, and that's a traditional thing. Uh, as to be, to be a thing that is part of the picture that makes the picture a precious object. The people who, who paid for this, they would be like uh, rich people who you know, had the resources to, to fund uh, the kind of art, artistic things to, to go in churches, uh, they did this in a kind of a self-serving way. That is, they they wanted to sort of buy themselves, buy their way into heaven uh, by 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 giving to the church. You know, they they probably made their money in some uh, nefarious way, and and they didn't want to to be punished uh, for the for those sins. So they they would uh, you know have indulgences. So so that would be a reason for it. And if you if you're spending money on the church in such a way that you want people to know that you're spending money, gold is, is a great way to do that. Uh, because it's very, it's, it's visibly very expensive. You know, you can see the money being spent. Also, the blue this isn't particularly good representation of the blue, but that blue is made out of a ground up uh, semi-precious stone called lapis lazuli. And it's, it is more expensive actually than gold. And using that blue is also a, uh, an instance of conspicuous consumption. So, uh, you know, making the thing look precious and expensive is part of the deal when you're when you're you do have a patron. Uh, but later on, the patrons will realize that you know you can your money can go further, and you can you can be more impressive by instead of paying money for the material, you're paying money for the skill of the artists. So. Over the course of these, you know, these two centuries or, or more, uh, there's going to be an increase in the status of artists and becoming more and more skillful. 
And one of the skills they have is just representing the world. And we'll see instances of how they, uh, how they increase that, that, those skills in different, in different ways. Uh, I want to look at another work by, by Giotto. It's in this building called the Arena Chapel, which is in Padua. And it's, it's one of those churches uh, that you know a rich patron gave all the money for. And it's just an opportunity, if you look at the inside, to have lots of wall space where Giotto could paint lots and lots of paintings. You know, it's just a big box, and it's a chapel. And it has stories of the life of Christ and the life of Christ's mother Mary, and, and uh, they're, they're almost like cartoons in a, in a you know, the, the Sunday comic uh, in the newspaper. You know, it's just like sequences of pictures telling stories. You know, if you look at the kind of thing in that first picture, this also had sequences of pictures telling stories. But this is so far removed from what we're looking at in the beginning of the 1300s. Because it is much, much bigger, and they're in fresco, and they are, uh, and they tell the stories in a very clear and convincing way of, you know, real people occupying real space, doing stuff, and, um, Giotto was, a, was an excellent storyteller. He very efficiently told lots of neat stories with, you know, a, a kind of an emotional impact, and you felt like these are real people that you could identify with. Uh, here's a little picture to kind of give the reality of what this building is like. It is marble. It has uh, walls made of plaster. The past plaster has been painted with, with a kind of a pigment pigment that will soak into the plaster when the plaster is wet when you first put it on. You can paint uh, a small amount before that plaster hardens, and, and that part will harden and crystallize with the pigment color, you know, inside the inside the, the, the plaster, so that it will last forever, or at least as long as the wall lasts. And so that's why the the color here looks bright, you know, uh, and, and it looks brand new. It looks very similar to the way it was painted originally, because fresco doesn't change. Uh, if you paint on top of the the plaster, however, when it's dry, um, the paint will flake off. And this this paint, which is that expensive lapis lazuli blue, uh, was painted on after it was dry. So it didn't last as well as all the other colors. In places of some of these pictures, if you were to look them up and look at all the pictures, you'd find many of the places the blue has been flaked off. Other than that, it, it's, it, it looks pretty black, brand new. Um, if we look at one of these uh, sculptural looking pictures, this is down down low, like right here. It looks like it's made of sculpture. Here's a figure, it's justice, and, and it's one of the virtues uh, to go against the, the vices that are in other parts. Uh, but the, you can see the, the figure looks like just the, the same figure that Mary was in the uh, Madonna and Child of the Throne we just saw. The throne looks very similar to it, but this uh, feeling you get is of a real person in a real space. It's very convincing. You know, this, this little uh, sculptural relief at the bottom looks kind of medieval by comparison. You know, it doesn't really have a, a, a real place, a real uh, illusion of space where, where, th where this looks like, like reality, this looks like a sculpture. And uh, so that, that was a, a, one of the big, big innovations that, that Giotto had. Uh, here's a, a, one example of one of the stories where, this, where Christ is... Uh, uh, right after the crucifixion, where there is called the lamentation, where the uh, people are around him uh, lamenting his death, and the angels are up in the sky, all, all you know, displaying their grief in different ways. And just this, this is such a new thing uh, with Giotto is just showing emotion, showing people. I mean, actually going out and observing how people express themselves using, you know, body language and, and gestures and. And things to show how, how people feel and putting that in the picture. Another thing you can see here really easy is the these sections that are uh, uh, separate sections of different sort of colors of blue. That has to do with the, the way the uh, uh, frescoes are made. I mean, you, you plaster a bit and then you color it and then you plaster another bit and color it and you can only do as much as you can do in a day because you don't want to plaster the whole thing and, and not be able to finish painting it, otherwise it will harden and you'd have to 
you know, chip it all out, do it again, because it's because uh, uh, it dries kind of fast. Anyway, um, you can see the, the the people representing real emotions that they they're making gestures, and that and that you know they're surrounded in space. You know, there are people behind and people in front, people that would definitely have volume, and they and weight. You know, that's a this is the you know the big innovation that Giotto had. This is the work that's on your list that, that you need to know. Uh, but it's, uh, it's called The Kiss of Judas. It's one of the pictures in the, in the chapel. If we look, it's this one there. But here we are just cropped so you just see the single picture, not the, the patterns around it. But one of the, the, the neat things about, about this is that Christ is in the center here. You know, with Judas, and Judas, you know, he, he, he betrays Christ with a kiss, and so he's he he, he comes up to G to Jesus and to to show to the um, you know the Jew Jewish leaders which one is Jesus, so that you know he, the Jewish leader can point him out to the Roman soldiers to say which one to arrest, and then Peter's here who cuts off the ear of one of the soldiers, and uh, and I guess one of the disciples is running away, and this guy is grabbing his cloak. Back here, it's kind of hard to tell what this is, but these are, this is a bunch of soldiers, uh, and all you see is their helmets. And the helmets used to be covered with silver, you know, and the silver has flaked off because or tarnished or something, so it's not really visible anymore. But there would be a group of, of people back here indicated by just a bunch of helmets. Um, and you can see the, a lot of the blue has flaked away. But the, the soldiers came with a bunch of uh, spears, and those spears are, are going up in the air, and there's one of them has a club, and there's also a torch back there. Uh, so you have a series of these lines, these diagonal lines, and they, and they all seem to point, in a way, to Christ. And even the club is pointing to him, and, and this, this man's gesture is pointing to him, so that uh, uh, lots of things are, are pointing to Christ, is, is to, to emphasize Christ. Even these little curves coming up here are all leading to Christ's face. So it's, uh, you know, using a compositional thing to help tell the story, to create, create more impact, and to, you know, draw your eyes, as they say, uh, to things. And when we get to the next century, we're going to see uh, artists doing a similar thing by pointing to the head of the Christ or, or to some other part of a composition to point it using, using a, a perspective the lines of perspective to do that, rather than the chance position of a bunch of, of spears, which doesn't happen all that often, uh, but you can use perspective to do that as well. So he's, he's beginning a trend that's, that's going to be continued throughout. Let's look at another thing, is this halo. Look back to a halo from, say, say here. Halos are indicated by a circle drawn around a person's head. Well, here's Mary with a halo, Christ has a halo. Every saint has a halo, and halos are, you know, they traditionally go back to when, you know, when, when Moses came off the mountain and he, and he was glowing, light was shining from his face, and, and early Christian um, um, uh, artists, you know, they, for early Christian art, they, they wanted to represent light shining from a person's countenance uh, in a graphic way in the Middle Ages, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have a means within their pictorial representation system to, to do that other than do it with symbolically with a circle behind a person's head. And since they were dealing with flat shapes on a flat ground, having it a perfect circle was normal. Uh, and it looks perfectly normal in, it, to some extent here. It looks, it looks more at home in a, in a Chumabui's. Everybody's head is, is, you know, has a perfect circle around it. Chumabui puts all sorts of neat little decorations within the gold to make it all pretty and, and decorative. But Giotto is starting to, to behave as though he, he's seeing people as real people in real space, in which case halos become a kind of a, a weird anomaly. You know, she's, where, 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 does the, where does the halo exist when you have a three-dimensional object behind you? Is it just like floating behind your head? And what if your head's turned? Like, here's a... Here's a person whose head is turned in profile. Um, why, why, is the, why is the halo staying this way? You know, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it, it doesn't fit the new system very well. 
in this one, uh, these people are, are in front of Mary, and they're looking back at Mary, yet in order to see her, they would have to be looking through their own halo. You know, so it's, it doesn't make that much sense uh, to have it in, to have complete three-dimensional people in the three-dimensional space that's very convincing and still have halos uh, that are drawn as circles uh, on the background. You know, the halo should move with the, with the, with the person, but, you know, there's, there's some things that, you know, you can innovate if you're an artist and you're, you get a commission to make a, make a Madonna and Child throne. Some things you have to keep traditional and other things, other places you can innovate. And that was one of those uh, things that came later. Well, let me look, go back to uh, the Christ here, that halo. It's not circular, is it? You know, it's kind of turned. Like you're, you're looking at it sort of at a three-quarter angle rather than flat against the ground or even edge on. So sort of splitting the difference between the two. If Christ were, you know, his head is perfectly in profile, and if, a, and if a halo were a disc behind a person's head, then it ought to be, you ought to be seeing it edge on. But, of course, that wouldn't make sense in this picture. So uh, he's sort of split the difference between the two. He's kind of done that with, uh, with Peter, but it doesn't make any sense with Peter because we're looking at the back of his head. So, you know, that's not, that's not really working so much. But uh, with Christ here, this is, this is sort of an innovation, I guess we could say, in addition to all the others that's going on, you know, big figures that have lots of lots of volume and they're very convincing in their space and their gestures. The story is told in, in a very efficient way. Let's look at another artist uh, who lived very near uh, where Giotto came from in Florence. The Florentine tradition that we we see with Giotto begins, uh, you know, a tradition that's going to be a, a big part of most of the the art of the of the 1400s and the 1500s is going to be Florentine. Uh, but there's a small town called Siena nearby, just a you know like a 30 minute bus ride away. Uh, and in Siena, they have their own you know Giotto type type artist who's innovating from the uh, art of the Middle Ages. His name is Duccio, D-U-C-C-I-O. And Duccio has uh, this altarpiece called the Maestà. It would be the comparable thing to, uh, to Giotto's uh, Madonna and Child, though in this case it's a much larger, more complex uh, altarpiece with a giant program. Lots, lots more figures. It's horizontally arranged, and it has lots and lots of other figures, small paintings that are all over it. You can see here there's an Annunciation. There's several... Uh, images. So this is as if it, it had all the pictures from from uh, Giotto's Arena Chapel, all in a in a in a single painting, uh, in a very complex program. All on the back is also covered with small panels, and we'll see we'll see a few of those as well. This is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like when it was put together. Um, it's 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 in pieces now. But let's look at the way he re represents the Madonna Child and Throne. Like Giotto, he has a three-dimensional throne that is convincing as a three-dimensional object in space, and she is in that space. But she also kind of looks like a cutout. The emphasis is not so much on her volume. Let's take a quick look at Giotto's Madonna. You know, she looks massive. You know, the, 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 the modeling of her figure and the modeling, especially the knees here and the drapery, I feel as though I can say, yes, this is a, a fully rendered three-dimensional person, you know, very um, massive. The CNEs aren't don't go in that much for that. They 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 still have more realistic looking people, uh, but they have a kind of a decorative quality to them. The, the when I think of doll-like features, like you know, having a head that's a little bit larger in proportion than that ought to be and uh, emphasis on all sorts of color and line, like especially these little arabesque sort of lines, like this, these beautiful little lines that just go around everything. That's a, that's a, that's a decorative thing that, that's really just a Sienese variant on, on this theme of moving in the direction of, of, of reality. Um, Duccio, you know, wants to make a, 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 a individual portrait of everybody, you know, so every saint looks like a real person with, with his own attributes, 
Uh, every angel looks different, different expression, or at least you know, kind of different. Uh, they look kind of like brothers and sisters. But the the saints, you know, they all they all look like different people, and he's gone to paints to to represent them as different people. It's a very pretty thing. You know, here's another version, of another another uh, reproduction of it. You can see it a little bit more clearly. Um, diaphanous cloth. You can kind of see through it. Um, lots of pretty decorations. You can't really see see it in this reproduction, but there's lots of of little details. This little bit of cloth is just sort of uh, has a little kink in it right there. Uh, naturalistic details where. Mary, if you look at that face of Mary, it's, it's, it's lifted from you know any any picture of Mary from the Middle Ages. So this is very conservative. This is this is just like anything for for the last thousand years. Whereas all these other things, those little fingers sticking over the edge, and little hands sticking over the edge, to make it look like this is real, uh, a real throne, a real object, and people uh, leaning against it up here, or angels leaning up against it. Yeah, you know, people in front, people beside. You know, these are these are these are attributes you can have when you have something in in space. So let's look at on the back. As I said, there's a bunch of panels, and there's one panel in particular that I want to show because it is of the same theme, same same story as what we saw Giotto depicting. It's called the Kiss of Judas. It has almost every feature the same. Uh, a crowd of, of soldiers in the background uh, surrounding Christ and, and Judas, who sort of make a unit here in the middle. Uh, Peter off the side, cutting the ear off the soldier, uh, a bunch of people running away. And uh, this, this is the guy, I forget his name, who's one of the Jewish leaders who's pointing out Christ, or who, who's been, who's, who's decided which one is Christ so that he can tell the soldiers uh, to get him. But, he doesn't have the, the same sort of thing with the, with the spheres that Giotto had. You know, it doesn't have that compositional unity or clarity that, that, that Giotto had. You know, he has more figures, uh, more extraneous details like trees, and this landscape, this real fanciful sort of rocky landscape. Uh, it's, a, it's the sort of thing they liked in, in Siena. But still, the behavior of the people, the individualization of the people, the, the rendering of cloth in such a way that it looks like, you know, it has its own kind of three-dimensionality to it. It feels, you can see the figure underneath the cloth in a lot of places. Uh, you can see, you know, gestures and movement and, and, and lots of uh, good storytelling that's going on in this. Uh, but if you had to say which is more forward-thinking and which is more medieval, this does have kind of doll-like figures. They're kind of like cutouts and... and uh, you know, to some extent, many many aspects of this are are still in the in the medieval camp, whereas Giotto is fully you know on his way towards towards the Renaissance. Um, I say that even though you know some of the pictures, like this one, uh, of this also on the back of the Maestal altarpiece. It's not one on your list, but just to show you another aspect of of this same artist. Um, this is Christ entering Jerusalem. There's Christ on a donkey with a uh, a crowd of disciples here, and then a crowd of, of people here, and they're kind of on this road, and because it's a vertical composition, you know, the artist has to get the, the sense that uh, he, he's on, he's standing on this road, which is not particularly convincing. The road is sort of pitched f f towards us, whereas they're more profile-looking, uh, so that's not really clear, and also there's some weird wonky things going on with the the doorway and stuff. They see it's like he's trying to show things as three dimensional, but he, he's it's 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 like he's trying to speak a foreign language and doesn't really know how to do it. Uh, and then you go up the street, and then you see this architecture up here. You say, oh, "Look at this!" I mean, this is that building. You know, it's an archway, like a doorway into a city. And then you see some, you know, one of those architectural things. I guess it's like a the top floor poking out over the over the street and, and look at this building. It's like the the church church tower or the, the, the top of a church. Um, or maybe a baptistry or something. Well that's that looks real. You know, whoever made this, and presumably Duccio made it, you know, it doesn't look this this looks kind of amateurish comparatively speaking. 
though you know an effort is being made here to make it look like three-dimensional. But up here, well, I'm I'm entirely convinced that that's a that's that's not different in in a large extent to a photograph of of this building, you know, in terms of you know this angle here, this angle here, and the the pitch of the roof and all that. I mean, it, that that looks very real. So. Uh, there is some observation of the real world going on, and and, uh, and you know bits and pieces here and there are very convincing. So let's look at you know the, the next generation of Sienese artists in a, in another painting. Here, let me show you the uh, the full altarpiece. It's by Simone Martini, and it's uh, Annunciation. Here it is, Annunciation with Saints. Uh, Two saints, and there's a saint here and a saint here. So it's a simplified version of uh, of the altarpiece of Maya Stahl in terms of the subject matter. It just has uh, Gabriel announcing to Mary that she's going to have a baby. In the center part, you know, there's a group group of uh, angel kind of figures over here, and then two saints on either side. You know, probably patron saints of wherever this goes, and you know, it's a very elaborate frame. You know, made by you know, a carpenter, you know, this is, you know, the, a, a different craftsman makes this part. Uh, and, you know, it's gold and very pretty and going, hey. But let's talk about just the fact that it's an annunciation, meaning it's the story of the announcing of, of the birth of Christ to Mary. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theme we're going to be seeing several instances of, and I want to, uh, I want you to understand that this is the way this story goes, I mean, with, Gabriel's kneeling on the left and Mary on the right, responding in some way. Oftentimes there's symbols like lilies and other plants and stuff to indicate that, that it's, uh, you know, symbols that represent Mary. And it, it is a common thing, and it's uh, something we're going to see several artists paint this same sort of thing uh, a number of times. And, you know, when we get to test time, we're probably going to be comparisons in those. And, and you may see a comparison between two enunciations, say. And if you were to do that, it, the fact that they're two of the same story being told would be an opportunity to show that you, uh, you know, understand the different styles. Like th th this style is the CNE style. It's Italian. And that when we see something, that enunciation that is made by somebody from, say, the north of Europe, you know, they will have a different way of doing it, but they're still telling the same story. So uh, there'll be similarities and there'll be differences. And uh, and when I go through and talk about these pictures, you know, these are the sort of things uh, that, you know, the reason for knowing these things is so that you could compare one to another and know that, you know, there's a different style going on. So what is this Italian style? One is that there's... Uh, an indication that there's space, that there's, you know, that this surface upon which uh, the scene takes place is one where you know, there's room for uh, the throne that, that Mary's sitting on, for her person, for for Gabriel to come in, and a little flapping drapery. Uh, all that is supposed to happen is kind of in a space. It's, it doesn't have a whole lot of indication of, of space because it's got a gold background, uh, but otherwise it, it looks like there's enough to com accommodate these figures. There's also this figure and this figure who both are seem to be in a different space. It seems it has a different ground line than this one. It's like it's almost like it's it's not meant to be seen as continuation of the same space. It's not like this saint is standing on the same floor that these are. But otherwise, if you just look at that as a separate painting, it does look like this figure is standing on the ground with weight, and that the figure you know, has some volume, and that and that the drapery and everything, you know, looks like the artist has actually looked at real drapery and studied how it falls. You know, to give you a, a bit of contrast, we go way back at the, you know, up to here. Here's a saint standing just like that one. But, you know, the, the feet here seem to be kind of, you know, just you know, dangling down there. It doesn't seem to have weight. And, and there's just a huge world of difference between, between that and this, you know, so uh, definitely even in Siena here, we're, we're moving away from that medieval thing 
and moving towards what we're going to see later is going to be the Italian Renaissance. Still, it has uh, the gold background and all the decorative uh, um, altarpiece stuff, which which still persists and fades away gradually over the course of the of two centuries until it becomes much more simpler, and and the uh, and the uh, and the figures in the space become much more real. So that's enough for this first first part, and then we'll continue on the next one.